What would you call a video recorder that has everything? I'm calling smart. It's a Zenith VHS with extraordinary VHS hi-fi stereo. Smart. Plus a remote that can control both the deck and the TV. Control is both. That's smart. And clear special effects. Smart. One of the new smart decks. Zenith's VHS video recorders. When you want everything. Very smart. And here it is. Straight from 1984. A Zenith Smart deck. This is the VR 4000. I believe there was three of these uh, that Zenith released in 1984. They're all made by JVC, and this actually marks uh, the year that Zenith abandoned Betamax and stopped rebranding Sony Betamax machines and started rebranding JVC VHS machines. So 1984, they had three models, the VR 2000, 3000, and 4000. All four head. There was no two head models. And this was the top of the line one. And this was the clone of the JVC D725, I believe, which was JVC's first Hi-Fi VCR coming out in 1984. And there's a, when you look at it, the controls, everything, the layout, very, very similar. Like the, even this little door flap here that has the little indicator when there's a tape in there, that's totally JVC. This one is all silver face though, which I actually like better. Zenith had this font about them and this sort of regal silverness that, uh, I don't know, they really did things neat. Yeah, they, they, they you know, we're just rebranding Japanese stuff and then they were going downhill, but they still, they had neat stuff, different, and not always good, but interesting. So just an overview of the front controls. You have a uh, soft power control, push in for timer mode, uh, tape TV, which is like your TV VCR, turns your RF modulator on and off. These LEDs are a little dim, but everything has an LED indicator. Uh, this is push in for EP, SP, it's JVC, so only two speeds. Eject. This LED flashes when it's ejecting. Uh, insert for video insert editing and audio dubbing, which is kind of neat. Record, play, uh, fast forward and rewind. So this is non visual fast forward and rewind. And it's also speed search. So this function you have to press and hold to do visual search. Then there's play stop. And then this is video action. So when you press it, the LED will go to one speed, which is basically pause. I haven't quite figured that out yet. But then you press it multiple times and it will move and speed up. And this one latches on. So you got about three or four different speeds of forward and reverse search that latch on and off, or you can just momentarily press and hold and let go. So that's pretty neat. VU meters. Uh, what I notice is these only work for the tuner and hi-fi audio. They don't actually do anything for linear audio. I don't know if that's because this has issues or by design. Uh, who knows? Lovely stereo Dolby. Uh, this is the uh, counter or time remain. This will actually calculate the remaining time, which is a Nice feature they started to introduce around this time on the higher end models. Counter reset. You have a full keypad either for the tuner or for when you're setting the clock. Your channel controls and of course instant record like OTR on other models. And then you've got this nice magnetic door that flips down. This is the remote sensor that pushes through. That's pretty common. And looking here, you have your Dolby noise reduction with a nice indicator there. Audio dub, so you can set your audio dub to use channel one, channel two, or stereo. Audio dub, of course, is only linear audio. Then your audio out, again, now this is for hi-fi or linear, you can set that. Now this is kind of cool. To switch between long, which is linear audio, or hi-fi, there's a mixer control and what I've found and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a bit is that 
when you set, set it in the middle, it's half and half between them. But all the movies I've tried, the phasing is slightly out between these two. So you end up with this weird garbly sound. Like the, the, the audio is out of phase, so you just, they almost cancel each other out and it sounds really nasty there. But you can adjust this to have your linear stereo audio or hi-fi, your headphone output. There's actually a switch on the bottom for high and low output for the headphones. There's no uh, like volume control, there's just a switch on the bottom. Your microphone inputs for left and right. Picture sharpness, tracking for slow and normal. This is for the taper main counter. You can set it to a T120 or T160 for the calculations. Your uh, tape memory, so you can set it to off count, which I believe is zero, or Q. I think you can queue up a number. I haven't tried that yet. Your source select, tuner, auxiliary, and SC. That might be like combination, like some say simultaneous. Not sure. And for your tuner, you can have antenna or cable. There's automatic fine control for the tuner, for the fine control tuning. Uh, automatic level control, so you can set your level recording controls for hi-fi manually or have it set to ALC, which is, basically will have a limiter on it, so it'll kind of keep it from going too loud. And then, I almost missed these. These are membrane controls. So, like for example, dimmer, you know, because it can go even dimmer, it can't go any brighter. I think the power supply in this, well, it definitely needs a recap. The caps are bulging. But yeah, everything's a little dim. These VU meters, as they go up, you can see the, they dim. So the more of, more of the LEDs that are lit, the dimmer it gets. So yeah, this thing needs some, needs some love. And this is all for setting your clock and your recording. So you can manually set it to SPEP on here, independent of what this switch is doing. Set your day, program start, stop, clock adjust, uh, repeat, I don't know what that is. I'll have to figure that out. But yeah, very futureful. And I picked this up and uh, it was disgusting inside, like just filthy disgusting. It looked like it's been, you know, sitting in storage for 20 years. It has that smell like for the first five years of his life, people smoked around it. And then for the last 10, 15 years of its life, people were trying to get rid of the smoke smell in their home. So it's got that sort of Glade plug-in grandma's house smell. It, 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 if I could name this smell, grandma's apartment. And it came with the original remote, which is pretty neat. This was a very early universal style remote. Let's get the focus going. You can see the, I think this is like a aluminum. You can see the aluminum's oxidizing in this weird pattern on the top. And uh, I lost a button. I lost six and I lost mute, TV video mute, down the drain when I was cleaning this because I'm an idiot. Oh well. Uh, yeah, it's got, uh, well, I can't demonstrate it now and I'll show you why. But this is early universal remote so it can control the TV or the VCR. But of course, only Zenith brands. So they were, RCA was doing something similar. A lot of these brands were starting to give you convenience if you bought all their brand. So the reason I'm not going to show it to you right now is the type of battery that this uses. This uses a J type, type J six volt battery. And I have the battery here. Came with it, it's totally dead. And anyone remember these from when they were young? I do. I think my, my parents had a Zenith TV until I was like one or two that they hated. It was one of those cool space command ones that had a zoom function and apparently it was very unreliable. And they were glad to be rid of it. And I think the remote for it used this similar Energizer J type battery, which I think these were also used in cameras. I think this is a camera type battery. And uh, yeah, 
very weird, very proprietary, very annoying. But what I can do is I can just hook it up to a power supply. Ha ha! Elaborate. So now I'm running it eh, close enough to six volts. Flip this guy around. There we go. Oh, you know what? I bet you that light is causing a problem. I'm going to shut that off. Oh, that didn't solve it. What's weird is the remote sensor's over there. But if I bring it over here, I get nothing. Got to come right about center and then it works. Very weird. But all the functions work. I've tested all the playback controls. They all do what they're supposed to. This has an index button and a go to. So I believe this also supports indexing. And that's where it would basically just leave a little index mark. I think it was on the tracking, uh, the control pulse um, line on the tape. So you could basically scan and find your index, and leave a little index mark. So you could go, okay. And I think that's, oh, that's what the Q is on the, the memory. I think it just, it'll let you go to the next index that you've recorded. Kind of a neat idea. A lot of machines had this. I, I've never used it. It would have been actually very useful, but I've, I've never used it. So now I'm going to demonstrate it. And uh, yeah. In order to do that, I have to pop the top off and I will show you why in a second. Top popped. And for my convenience, I haven't even put the screws back in that hold this board. And check this out. Well, other than this brown circuit glue that I have to clean off, that's bad stuff. It has a little plastic clip on the back here. When I lift the board up, click, it holds it. It's a heavy board, but it holds it. If you take a look, these little clips. I feel like I'm going to be breaking them off every time I do this, but they just hold it up. Yeah, surprising, surprisingly resilient. And we're inside. There's a bit of noise in the video head. It's getting better. When I first got this, the head barely moved. Just from using it, it seems to be getting better and better. Actually, when I first got this, it barely did anything. It's been slowly waking up. And those capacitors are... <laughs> gonna have to be replaced. Uh, when I first got this, I just popped a tape in and played it. Like I didn't even clean the, the transport was the cleanest part. It was disgusting in here, but like a lot of these machines, they were kept clean, at least on the tape transport. So perfect, clean picture, you know, no issues there at all. And, uh, I was trying to figure out why sometimes it would only, the tape tra would only load the tape to here. These two guides would stop and then go back, and this belt was slipping. As you can see, I've put an elastic band there. I thought, oh, I don't have a replacement for this, but maybe I'll just temporarily put an elastic band on here because this is slipping. And sometimes the fast forward and rewind wouldn't work. So they would just make this grinding sound and shake the tape up and down. Sometimes it wouldn't play. It would just pause, like the capstan motor isn't spinning. Very weird stuff, and then I realized the tape isn't going down all the way and the brake. So on the bottom of a VHS tape, you have this hole where you poke, it pokes a little post into and that releases the brakes on here. And what was happening is this tape is not going down all the way to disengage the brakes sometimes. And uh, going through here, so I'm pushing this tape in and as you can see, it's getting stuck. Now, where is it getting stuck? Let's take a look in here. As you can see, there's a little thing right there. And that, it's hitting it. But look at this, look at this, um, whatever you want to call it, the, the little assembly. This is moving when I'm pushing the tape in. And if I hold it back, the tape, I'll oh, push it all the way back here, the tape should slide right past that. And what that's supposed to do, that little piece is, that's supposed to push in that little button there. 
See that little button that releases the front flap? Yeah, so what's happening is that this uh, ah, cartridge thing is moving too soon. And I went, okay, well maybe it's misaligned or something, or maybe something's broken. So when I get the tape in, okay, just pushed it in. Look at how far I, I can push it down. I'm going to hit eject and show it from a different angle. So let's try pushing the tape in again. Yeah, that time it didn't even take it. Now take a look and I'll push it down. So normally there's a spring pushing down on this. As you can see, there is no spring. So once I push this down, then it seems to work just fine. Um, I thought, okay, well, it's got to be something in the loading here. Yes, it is. I'm going to insert some video over here of me looking at it. There's a spring on a gear, and there's a little plastic hook that holds that spring into place with quite a bit of tension. Oh, look, a loose spring in the loading mechanism. And I bet you it clips onto this guy, and I bet you this had a bit of a hook to hold it in place. And that spring pushes the cartridge all the way out on the eject side and pushes the cartridge all the way down in the loading side. And of course, a plastic gear that's 20, 36 years old, it's going to fatigue and it's going to snap. And it broke, probably in storage or when it was transported. And that's the problem with this machine. Thankfully, if I open it up and push the tape down, it works great. It's got fantastic picture, excellent sound. But yeah, the loading mechanism is broken. And I did just a quick eBay search, couldn't really find anything on that gear, but I'm going to do more, more research because this thing deserves it. This is a, an absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal, well-built machine built by JVC, the original G VHS guys. Uh, it has linear stereo and hi-fi stereo. It's a four head double azimuth, double azimuth, which uh, surprised me for a machine so uh, old. Check this out. See the video heads are together side by side. And that is what they call double azimuth. Double azimuth. So rather than being at, I can't remember if they're 90 degrees or a, they're, they're at a different angle from each other. The idea is that these fields work opposite. So you have EP heads and then SP heads and they'll catch, this one will catch what the other one doesn't. It's basically cleaner special effects is what it gives. But the fact that this is double azimuth, double azimuth, kind of, I don't know, that surprised me. Maybe the lower end models from this year were a uh, traditional forehead. Uh, this has got all the bells and whistles. And the price matched at the time. Check out how much this cost. Like, this is insane. This is from 1984. This was the top of the line model in a lot of catalogs that I looked up for this year. I didn't really find much for the JVC model, but I imagine it was also, you know, top end for the time. All right, let's test out some tapes on this. So first, I'm going to try drum tuning. Come on. Not happy. Happy. Give it a push and a play. And uh, in the past decade, though, one of my main focuses has been in doing research and development and drum. So we'll do pause. It's a decently clean pause. I'll try another one. That's pretty decent. This TV is really really showing a de-inter... This TV doesn't de-interlace the uh, special effects very well from this VCR. But on a CRT it would be fine. Next we can try and speed search. Nice and fast. 
I'll do a wine scan. Also excellent. Today, which I'll explain later. So now, good question. I press this and it goes to the first LED, and you can see it's just paused. And I press it again. Sometimes you have to press it a few times. There we go. So now, this looks like it's just playing regularly, but without the uh, sound. Press it again. Now we're a little faster. Press it again. Faster still. And there we go. Full speed. And you can do the same thing with backwards as well. Oh, so you press this and it will slow down. Cool. And I can go backwards. Start going back, faster, faster, and that's as fast as it goes. Design Pretty good. I'm really looking forward to, to sharing my So we can the tracking control. And as you can hear, the audio cuts out, and that's because right now, uh, I have the instrument. set to hi-fi. This will so now let me turn it to linear. Make the drums an inspiration to your playing. And also make the drums feel great to you. Not just okay, but feel great. Now because if I turn it to the middle. Be an obstacle to playing music. See what gets quiet? Hi-fi. That's in the middle. And then I'll go to linear. Much better. And that's the mix. So, it there's a phasing issue with this. And I don't know if it's just the way the tapes are recorded or something in the circuitry has gone a bit slightly out of spec, you know, due to age. But it's very interesting. The back actually has two audio outputs. It has a mix output and a direct hi-fi audio output. So right now I'm plugged into the mix, but uh, after this I'm gonna try plugging into hi-fi to see what that does differently. Play. So you have sharpness. Crank up. Crank down. And what else do we have? Uh, I noticed just a correction from earlier. I don't think this is the original remote. Looking at those ads, they had one with a lot more buttons. I think this is a more basic remote, possibly from a newer or older model, which means that I'm missing controls on here. So this probably has some slow motion frame advanced stuff on the remote that's missing on the front here, which would explain why I have slow tracking, but I don't really have slow motion for or frame advance or anything here. So I think that might only be on the remote. Anyway, play again. And so if I go remain counter, so I got an hour 25 remain if this is a T120. And then, or I have an hour 43 if this was a T160. I have no idea what this tape is. Probably a 120. Just for the uh, for the sake of it, let's try out an EP recording. Doesn't like it. Come on. Yeah. Total success. Okay, let's hit play. It, the nice thing that's cool is this flashes while it's loading as a status and then changes to solid when it's playing. 
So I'll adjust the tracking because this is recorded off TV in hi-fi. So I've got hi-fi linear. Interesting, these aren't working now. The reason why these view meters only work in hi-fi and weren't working is because they're there for you to adjust the record level. So when I have this set to automatic, we hit play here, I get nothing. The moment I flip it to manual, there we go. Now this one is interesting because it will match the speed of the scan to the playback. So this will actually move the motor faster when it's fast forwarding on SP than EP. So I'll go here. Like that's really not that fast. If I go, let's crank up the speed here, see how fast it'll go. Oh, it just slowed down. Huh, interesting. So I'm going to try plugging into the hi-fi output and see what that does on here. It actually has an interesting uh, jacks on the rear here. Stereo access. So I, I don't know if this is maybe a direct feed from the hi-fi signal. I, I don't know what you'd do with it if you had your own decoder. But it's probably related to this DAC switch, digital to analog converter. I don't know why that's off. I'm getting hi-fi, so. Oh, no, wait, hi-fi is analog. So maybe this is something similar to uh, PCM audio that uh, Betamax offered. I don't know. So you've got audio out, or audio in, video in, video out, hi-fi audio out, and mixed audio out. So I'm gonna move this to hi-fi now, see what that does. All right, so the hi-fi audio out is exactly as it's described. This control no longer does anything, and it's only hi-fi. I had to put the SP tape back in because no matter how much I played with the tracking, I couldn't get the hi-fi audio to go away. I could just get it to click and buzz a little bit. So play. And it cuts out. So this is before VCR started auto um, switching between the linear audio and hi-fi. Very interesting and I mean it's it's good to have the control but it's kind of annoying for just an average user who just wants audio and they have to tweak these settings and get it just right. And let's demo the rewind. Pretty decent. Fast forward. And since this does have the speed sensors for the two different reels, it will slow down towards the end. But it's not going very fast anyway, so it, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference. All right. The last thing I want to show is a movie. Well, I'm not going to obviously show the movie on here, but uh, I found out that this movie from 1997 has uh, hi-fi audio, obviously, but the uh, the linear audio track is stereo from 1997. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the audio directly and I'm going to move from the hi-fi track 
to the linear track so you can directly hear the difference and also in the middle with that weird out of phase recording sp5 nuclear torpedoes if the cruise hits them order them to abort the missile hms chester urgent white knights come in abort missile abort missile come in abort missile abort missile Captain, sir, missile out of range. And sounded pretty good on SP. You'll notice that the audio is a lot flatter, uh, there's not a lot of low end, and the dynamic range obviously suffers, which was the whole big selling point of Hi-Fi. Uh, EP sounds like trash, that was great. But what I want to show here is you'll notice I didn't do SP without noise reduction. That, that was the first recording that I did. And look at the right track here. So it looks like a component in the recording circuit was waking up as I was recording. So you can see at the beginning here, there's only the one channel. And then as I move along here, it starts waking up. Very interesting. If you do want to get at the bottom of the mech for this, there are four screws, one here, one here, and then two on these plastic white clips on the back, and you'll be able to get it mostly open. Um, you can unplug some of these cables to get a little bit more leverage here, but uh, then obviously, you know, you lose functionality in some of these boards and whatnot, so you can still get in and kind of see what's going on down here see that Ontario gear everything doing its thing down here but uh yeah i'm just kind of putting this back together i want to show that so you got your loading motor this is your um, capstan motor as the drive to the idler here so in terms of belts there's a rubber idler there's a belt here and there's a belt for the tape loading motor right here that I just have a rubber band on right now and then obviously you're yeah listen to that head 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 head